Idan Rakovsky. I am an Avrech. Avrech is a Beit Midrash fellow in Beit Midrash Zichron Dov. Beit Midrash Zichron Dov is a community Beit Midrash. In other words, it's a place to learn and study Torah. Torah, Zionism, engage with the community, engage with the shul. I'm also the rabbinic assistant in Sha'arei Tfilah congregation, right on Bathurst and, uh, and Wilson. Um, and um, I'm <laughs> the rabbinic assistant and uh, I enjoy, I came from Israel uh, with my wife Priel, who she, she's working in Ulfa Natorot, which is the girls' high school, um, not far from here. And uh, we came here as Shlichim from Israel uh, for a period of time to work with the people, to get to know new people, to learn Torah together, and to try and, uh, and I would say, enrich our daily Jewish life as much as possible. I would also ask if you could please mute yourselves um, during this lecture, unless you're going to have any kind of a question, and I will explain the setting in a minute where we're going to have time for questions in that sense. So uh, this is about myself, this is about the Beit Midrash, and a little bit about this program. So this program is called Jewish Ethics in Light of Pirkei Avot. I will explain what is Pirkei Avot in a minute, but what, what I want to achieve from this kind of program is for all of us to understand even better, I'm sure we all understand that, but I want us to understand even better the fact that our Judaism, our Torah has something to say about everything about any current ethical discussion, moral discussion that you can hear in the news in Israel or outside of Israel, the Torah has actually something to say about everything. We might not like it, we might disagree with it, we might very much embrace it and like it, but the Torah has something to say. Our Torah, Chazal, our sages are saying the Torah is Torah Chaim. Torah Chaim is Torah of life. Our Torah is the Torah of life. In other words, we can see the Torah and feel it in any point you know, during your life and during your daily uh, routine and during your week, on, on, I would say on a weekday also, hourly, or maybe on a minute basis of our daily life. So this is what I'm trying to achieve on this program, uh, um, uh, on this program today. We're going to have three meetings, three sessions um, in the coming um, four weeks. We're going to have another one next week, and then we're going to have one week off, and then we will resume with the last third session on May 30th. This is how we're going to do it. It's going to be wonderful. I promise. Please come again. You will love it, uh, I hope, as much as I love this, uh, this topic. So I want to open with something you might be familiar with if you're following Israeli news. And this is what we're going to focus on today. You can see on your sources. By the way, there are all sources in the link in the chat box. You can all see it. The sources are down over the wall there. I'm not going to share the screen, as I said before. Um, I wanted to see it in the last page, actually. Let's start from the last page. Um, I don't know how many of you, again, are following Israeli news, but um, in the last, I would say, four or five months, uh, even a little bit more than that, even in the last, I would say, seven months, there, was, there is a very interesting discussion regarding subsidizing uh, um, daycares for Avrahim, for, for Betay Midrash, for, for students that learn Torah, who are not going to work. They decide, those of Rahim decide to learn instead of going to work for many, many reasons. They really believe the Torah study is something that uh, um, enriches their life in the, the state of Israel, something that is very important, something that they should do if they can on a daily basis. And they want, and they actually get it, a support from the state, from the government, in terms of it can be a, a reimbursement, it can be a grant of money, and it can also come to an expression by helping with daycares for their children. This is something that is way long happening in Israel for many, many, many years. And during the last, uh, I would say, five or six coalitions, the Haredi party or the Frum, the more, more ultra-Orthodox parties were also part of the coalition. That's why it also continued. But we're in a different situation nowadays, and the ultra-Orthodox parties for after many, many years, they're actually not part of the coalition anymore. And the Minister of Economy, which is Avigdor Lieberman, you can see his picture right here, Avigdor Lieberman, uh, his entire, I would say, campaign running to be the Minister of Economics, he said, we must stop this funding. It can't be that people that pay taxes go to work are really, really working hard every day to put bread on the table. It can't be that they are funding with their own taxes families who don't do it. Can't be. That's what they said. Many, many people support it. Many people didn't support him. But he actually won. I mean, he, he, he got to be the Minister of Economy. 
And he actually decided to cancel this subsidizing. It was, in, you can see here, that's, uh, um, that's from, uh, from the news. You know what, let's read it together. That's uh, in, the, in the last page of, uh, of our sources. I'll read it together from the Times of Israel. They wrote it follow. Finance Minister of Igor Lieberman on Wednesday announced plans to introduce new conditions for receiving daycare subsidies for kids up to age three, effectively ending them for some 21,000 children whose fathers are full-time yeshiva students. Now we need to understand the law says that if one of the parents is working, only one of the parents is working, that's fine. That's enough for the government to help to support the family in subsidizing the daycares. If one of the, if one of the parents, I mean, the mother is working some hours during the week, that's fine for them. Look what he did. Lieberman said that the subsidies will be granted only if both the child's parents work at least 24 hours a week. That's not a lot, but 24 hours a week. Currently, only mothers must meet this requirement for a family to receive the monthly subsidy of 1,000 Israeli shekels in US dollar, that's around 305 US dollars, a little bit more if this is uh, uh, Canadian dollars, but this is around the amount each month that you're getting to. It's not a lot. It's not covering everything, of course, but it's a small help for someone who doesn't go to work and only one of the parents is working. It's something that can really, really help. With fathers exempt if they are involved in studies, the change is expected to end the subsidies for around 18,000 households. That's a lot. In which the father studied Torah full time and will take effect at the start of the new school year in September. By the way, I will tell you that just around three weeks ago, if I'm not wrong, the Supreme Court um, got involved into this discussion. He said it could not start in this September. They need to work on the law again, but eventually this is probably what's gonna happen. They postponed it a little bit, but this is, this is where, this is the direction that the government is facing, is pointing to. Families in which the father does not work at least 24 hours a week, but is involved in academic or vocational studies will still be eligible for the subsidies, which will end for yeshiva students only. In total, the daycare subsidies are estimated to cost the state a yearly of 1.2 billion Israeli shekels. 1.2 billion Israeli shekels, of which about a third goes to families in which the father studies at a religious seminary. Now you can understand why this is like fire in Israel. These days you can understand why this is very much a basis of disagreement and dispute between different parts of the Israeli society. It's actually also a very, I would say, basis of dispute within our own coalition and government when some of the more religious sides of our very interesting coalition are very much against this reform of Avigdor Lieberman. Some of the more left side, the more secular side of the coalition are actually very much in favor. And it's not easy to, uh, to pass this law through, but probably it will. I brought here also, just for you to see, there is some data in this graphic, just to see the employment rates within the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel. This is dated back to 2018. You can see it. Um, I know that this year there was an, uh, a little bit, uh, there was new data, but there's no such a big difference than uh, in 2018. The first line, you can see it right here. The first line is the non-ultra-Orthodox Jews, their employment rates in Israel. That means that since 1995, which was 83% of the non-ultra-Orthodox uh, Jews worked, were part of the employment circle. And in 2018, 87% of non-Orthodox, non ultra-Orthodox Jews went uh, uh, to work. The ultra-Orthodox, is at the bottom line. Just look, 51% back in 2018, only 51% of non-ultra-Orthodox Jews at the age of 25 to 64 went to work, all right? In the non-ultra-Orthodox, it's 87. Just think about the gap between that and this. You can see the average is 82 in, in, the, in Israel overall. Also, there's an impact of the, um, the, the Arabic uh, uh, groups in Israel that also have some problems with it, but they actually go to work in higher numbers. But you can see this is kind of an economical burden on Israeli on, on the Israeli uh, uh, economics. I would also mention that 50, around 51%, around the same numbers, are the number of families that are under poverty line within the ultra-Orthodox community, the ultra-Orthodox sector, around 51%. It actually makes very sense with the number. Almost every family that 
doesn't go to work, it's also under the poverty line. By the way, I have to say, they don't really feel it. The, the, the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel is wonderful in covering, I would say, creating this um, kind of, a, sorry? Illusion. illusion, okay, it's an illusion. But in creating this kind of a system that actually supports other families, it's called gmach, which is gmilut chasadi, which is think like kind of a kind of a communal bank in a sense that you can loan money. But there's no uh, um, help you with taxes, help you with other stuff you need, um, and it's actually very it's easier to be under poverty line if you belong to the uh, ultra orthodox community in Israel than not. Why do I explain all of this? This is right now in the midst of the news in Israel. Everyone is talking about it. And as I said before, the Torah has something to say about it. We're talking about Torah. Everything is Torah. Not everything is only news. And I want to do it. I want to discuss this. And in the other sessions that will come, I will present one thing every session. And I want to discuss it in light of one chapter of Pirkei Avot. What is Pirkei Avot? Pirkei Avot is a chapter, it's called a Mishnah. In our Mishnah, which is the textual, the, the rabbinic textual original, most, uh, I would say, ancient textual um, halachic source that we have, dated back then from the beginning of the Second Temple. All right, we're talking about the Second Temple era and afterward and beyond. We have different halachot, different Jewish rules that instruct our daily life. This is called the Mishnah. This is the most, I would say, ancient Jewish kind of codex, talking about Jewish rules codex that we have until today and we still learn it and we still study it and every rabbi one wants to approach a halachic question should start back then from the mission try to see how the halacha how the rulings evolve from there we also have the talmud which is the actual discussion upon the mishnah not everything is actually very clear in this mishnah some things are only being said as a statement but you need to figure out what exactly that says so that's why we have the Talmud. Some of you on the Zoom attended my uh, introduction to basic introduction to Talmud series, and you know a little bit of what I'm talking about. So I want to read one of the Pirkei in this, one of the Mishnah. This Mishnah is actually talking about moral, ethical issues, about values, who we are, what's important in the world, what are the Jewish values that we should go accordingly. And there is actually something that we can relate to this discussion, something that relates to this discussion, bless you. From Pirkei Avot, I wanted to see in this uh, in this square that I made right here. Look at source number one. I read in English. The second chapter in the second Mishnah of Pirkei Avot. Rabban Gamliel, the son of Rabbi Yehuda, the prince, said, Torah study is good with a worldly occupation because the exertion put into both of them makes one forget sin. All Torah without work will in the end result in waste and will cause sinfulness. All who work for the community should work for the sake of heaven. For the merit of the community's forefathers will help them, and their righteousness endures forever. And as for you, God will reward you greatly as if you accomplished it on your own. This is one of the Mishnayot in, that we have in our basic Jewish education text. We know we are not allowed to just sit and study and not go to work. This is Rabban Gamliel, the son of Rabbi Yudana. So how could we get, what happened in Jewish history that we got from this to this discussion today in 2022? The fact that there are some people who ask, we need help, we're not going to work, we're learning Torah. This is what I want to do today. And I want to do it by trying, first of all, to understand the historical context of Rabbi Yudana. I'm not going to get into practical halachic Kind of discussion. This is not this class. I want to stay focused on the area, the zone of Pirkei Avot. This is more what I'm trying to focus on this day. We'll, we'll, we'll get a little bit towards the end of the class about the pragmatic kind of uh, discussion also, but most of the time we'll stay in the area of Pirkei Avot. So what is exactly what, what Rabban Gamliel, this Rabbi Gamliel, what is he saying? So look in source number two, Rabbi Ovadia of Artenura, one of the biggest commentators on the Mishnah. Look what he says, how he explains it. If you say that you should always be laboring in Torah and its weariness causes sin to be forgotten for what is the need for work. Therefore, it was necessary to say that any Torah study that lacks work accompanying it leads to idleness for it is impossible for him to exist without sustenance, sustenance or food or, 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 or to put bread on the table. So he will attack and rob people and eventually forget his learning. We need to have food on the table. 
What it helps if you learn Torah and, and you don't have bread to put on the table. You'll go and steal it from someone else. And then what, what, what's going to be with the Torah? The entire Torah you just learned, the entire moral person you're trying to be will, will worth nothing if you don't work in that sense. So what is exactly this, I would say, historical background that this Rabbi Gamliel is talking to? It's very interesting. Every time I see a Mishnah, I see someone who says something, I think it's important for us to go back and try to understand what family did he grow up? Did he have money? Did he didn't have money? Maybe he experienced it firsthand. What led him to say what he said in this Mishnah? This is what we're going to try to do in this couple of minutes. So please go to source number three. From the Talmud of Giti, look what it says. From the days of Moses, until the days of Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, Rabbi Yehuda the prince, which is the father of this Rabbi Gamliel. Again, from the days of Moses and until the days of Rabbi Yehuda the prince, we do not find unparalleled greatness in Torah knowledge and unparalleled greatness in wealth and high political office in a single individual. Folks, this guy, Rabbi Gamliel, was born to one of the wealthiest families back then. His, his father, Rabbi Yehuda the Prince, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, was the strongest Jewish character. In the end, we're talking about after, later after the destruction of the Second Temple. He was one of the wealthiest. He had lands all over the place, all over the, 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 the state of Israel. And he was one of the wealthiest. Look what the Gemara is saying is that since the days of Moses, there was no wealthy person like this Rabbi Gamliel's own father. Not only that, he had political strength. Rabbi the prince was the Nasi. What is a prince? What does it mean? He wasn't a prince. We didn't have a monarchy with a king or with princesses and, and, and princes. What, what exactly did we have back then? We had the Jewish, we'll say it like that. The Jewish society back then, after being uh, um, went out of, of, of Jerusalem, because Jerusalem was uh, uh, fallen back to our to, to, um, um, to, to the Romans, and we had a problem with it. So there was a rabbi called Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. And he went out of Yerushalayim. We said everything is all going to be destroyed. The temple was not there anymore. They had, they had big, big problems. And he said, let's move the spiritual center from Jerusalem to a nearby city called Yavne. Yavne is also a city also today that's uh, a little bit of not really southern Israel, but not so far from Yerushalayim, around 40 minutes drive from Yerushalaym. And he moved with other fellow Jews and students to this city, Yavne, and he started to rebuild the Jewish life outside of Yerushalayim. Now think about it. There is no prophecy. There is no prophecy. There's no temple. The Kohanim, the, the, the priests are, are, are meaningless in this kind of world. How can you sustain, how can you rebuild Jewish life? So this Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai said, will establish a yeshiva. And this yeshiva will have two leaders. The first leader would be the Rosh Yeshiva. Rosh Yeshiva is the head of yeshiva. He would be the halachic authority. But we also have something called Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin would be an assembly, like a court that can judge the people and can actually decide what will be the future of the Jewish people back then. What are the rulings? Where, where will they live? What is the halacha? And the head, of this Sanhedrin will be someone called the Nasi, the prince. So the generations go by, they move from Yavne up north to the Galilee, and we get to Hillel. Hillel is the grand-grandfather. You know Hillel the elder. He's the grand-grandfather of this Rabbi Gamliel, and he was very, very poor. We will see it in a minute, but he was also the prince. And since Hillel, every generation, the prince, the Nasi, turned from the father to the son, from the father to the son, all the way until Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Yehuda the prince. He was the president, he was the prince, he was the Nasi, he was very strong, he had very good connection with the political, uh, I would say, um, we had political connections with the Romans back then. And this is the situation, this is where Looks like it never. He never, never experienced any problems, any financial problems. He doesn't know what it means to, to, to not work to work. And yet he's saying he could easily for himself stay all day at yeshiva, learn how much he wants. But no, he said, you need to go out to work because your Torah doesn't worth anything. I, I brought here a little bit more. You can see just to understand how wealthy they were, the family of Rabbi Gamliel. Look in source number four. The Talmud in Brachot states, that one only recites a special bracha on smell. We say it in Havdalah. 
We have a special bracha for the incense. So look what he says. One only recite to create fragrant trees. Boramine besamim over the balsam from the house of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi and over the balsam of the house of the Caesar. Only two balsams are so good and so wealthy and have such a good smell in the world that you only bless this bracha only on them. First one is the balsam of the Caesar, but also the balsam that is grown in the field, in the orchards of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. He was so wealthy and he had so great fruit in that sense. Let's see. Let's see what exactly is the family. We say about the Hillel, the elder, which was very, very, very old. It was very sorry. It was 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 a, the grand grandfather of Rabbi Gamliel. Let's see to what situation did he actually grow up in. So the Talmud in Yoma, in source number eight, says as follows: The sages taught a poor person and a wealthy person and a wicked person. Come to face judgment before the heavenly court for their conduct is in, in this world. To the poor person, the members of the court say, why did you not engage in Torah? If he rationalizes his conduct and says, I was poor and preoccupied with earning enough to pay for my sustenance. And that is why, and that is why I did not engage in Torah study. They say to him, were you any poorer than Hila who was wretchedly poor and nevertheless attempted to study Torah. They said about Hill the elder that each and every day he would work. He was, he was uh, how do you call uh, someone who's uh, like a timber? How do you say someone who's working with trees, cutting down trees? Yeah, timber, whatever the word in English, I don't know what you use it. This is what he used to do. How forester, forester, thank you. He was a forester. He worked, he was the greatest sage back then, but he had to work in the morning in, in the forest. He didn't just sit down in Yeshiva and learn. He didn't have money for that. And yet he was the, 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 the biggest sage back then. He was a forester. So they said about Hill the Elder that each and every day he would work and earn a half dinar. That's nothing. That's nothing. Half dinar is, is nothing worth any. And the sustenance of the member of his family. He needed back then to pay to the guard of the yeshiva to let you in. You need to pay in order to learn Torah. He wanted to learn Torah. He was the biggest sage. How can he learn Torah? He needs to work for that. So he paid half of his, everything he earned. He, learned, he paid for learning Torah. One time, the Gemara says, he did not find employment. To suspended himself and sat at the edge of the skylight in order to hear the words of the Torah of the living God from the mouth of Shemaya and Aftalion were the Rashi Yeshiva were the Torah scholars in this Torah study, in this school, the spiritual leaders of that generation. He ascended to the roof and he said, I will, I, I want to hear at least from the, maybe there's a window, maybe there's something I can listen to what the Torah has to say. I cannot come in, I don't have money. I'll come in and I'll try to listen a little bit of the Torah from the roof. So he climbed up the roof. So sages continued and said, that day was Shabbat evening. And it was the winter season of Tibet, and snow fell upon him from the sky. When it was done, Shemaya said to Avtalion, Avtalion, my brother, every day at this hour, the study hall is already bright for the sunlight streaming through the skylight. And today it is dark. Is it perhaps a cloudy day? They focused their eyes and saw the image of a man in the skylight. They ascended and found him covered with snow three cubits sunglasses on. high. They extricated sunglasses on. from the snow and they washed him and smeared oil on him and they set him opposite the bonfire to warm him. They said, this man is worthy for us to desecrate Shabbat for him. That was Shabbat. They were not allowed to, to burn on fire, but they saw him. The sun was so cold. They said, this is a man we are desecrating Shabbos. We are violating the rules of Shabbos. We're lighting up fire because this man is worthwhile in doing it. He needs to, he send it all the way up to the roof in order to hear Torah. This is a grand grandfather of Rabban Gamliel. So even though he was born into a very wealthy family, 
This family knew what it means to earn money in order to go and study. He didn't say it out of context, out of anything. He knew what he's saying because he grew up on this. Not only that, we know, I'm not going to read it inside. I'll say it outside. That even his father, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Yehuda the prince, was so wealthy, we said it, but he contributed so much money to help all the farmers in Israel back then that needed help during the Shemitah year. This year in Israel is the Shemitah year. In the Shemitah year, we're not allowed to work our fields, our, our gardens, our orchards. We're not allowed to touch the ground. Chazal or sages actually had a ruling that you know when you're not allowed, since when you start not touching the ground, you're not allowed to work it at all. Not from Rosh Hashanah, not from the beginning of the Shemitah year, but rather from when? From Shavuos. We're going to be in Shavuot in a minute. Since from Shavuot, the, the rabbis are saying you have something called an addition to the Shemitah year, to this Sabbath of the land, and you're not allowed to touch the garden since Shavuot. That's, that's more than one year of not touching the ground. So he said, I'm sorry, I need to cancel this kind of ruling because there are some farmers who need to work, they need to get some money. So even though he was born into a very wealthy family, they knew what it means that you need to work very hard to get it. And I would suggest this is the context in which Rabbi Gamliel is speaking to. This is a context in which he's saying that you must go to work along with learning Torah. But what happened? How come we move from this to a reality where people are not working in order to learn Torah? What happened in this area? So again, I'm telling, telling you, this is not an halachic oriented kind of class, just because I'm not gonna have enough time to dive into the very complicated kind of discussion regarding this. But I did bring some things that I think are worthwhile so noticing in this kind of sense. So the first thing is the Maimonides. The Maimonides, the Rambam, the great Maimonides, the one of the biggest, not the biggest, halachic authorities of all time in Jewish history. He was, a, he, was, he was a doctor, he was a physician. He worked while writing his books and while writing his halachic rulings. He was one of the people who, up, he was one of the largest, I would say, um, op uh, opponents to those who learned Torah to make a living out of it. He was one of the big, he said, you cannot go and study Torah without going to work. Look what he says. This is halakhically in source number nine. Now we're talking around 800, 900 years ago. All right? He says as follows. Source number nine. Whosoever sets his heart to pursue the study of the Torah, but do not secular work at all, and permit himself to be supported by charity, behold him, he blasts, he blasphemed the name and degraded the Torah and shadowed the light of religion and caused evil to be brought upon himself and deprived his own life from its share in the world to come because it is forbidden, says the Rambam, to enjoy all in this world in return of the, Torah, of the study of the words of the Torah. There is, it can be more explicit than that, can be more clear than that, that he took the Rambam saw, he learned what the Mishnah said in Pir Kayava, that one should only work along with the Torah. And he said, this is the halacha, this is the ruling instruction. But what happened? During the generations, we saw, first of all, that the Torah study became more and more serious in a sense that we had more and more and more text. Think about it. That back then in the Mishnah, they didn't have a massive amount of texts and books that you need to learn in order to be posted halakha, because they were the beginning of it. They were the beginning of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the halakhic world, in a sense. They're the one who formed it. They're the one who established it. So they didn't have to learn Talmud because there were no Talmud. They didn't have to learn halakha because there was no halakha. What they learned, well, later on, he learned. So the Rambam, when he, his generation, he has the Mishnah, he has the Talmud, but he doesn't have the things that will come after him. He doesn't have himself. Today, as someone who learns in yeshiva, I can tell you, I need to learn Mishnah, and Talmud, and Maimonides, the Rambam, and other books afterwards, and many, many, many books in order to get something that I can even speak and stand in front of you and give a lesson. So that's why later on, some people said, wait, if we want to be real Torah scholars, we can just learn three, four hours a day. We need to sit down all day in our schools, in our Torah academies, in our yeshivas. We need to sit down and learn as serious as possible. Following this, said the case of Mishnah, Maran Rabbi Yosef Karo, who, who lived around three, 400 years after the Rambam, he said as following on the Maimonides himself in source number 10, look what he says. All the sages before and after the Rambam, the Maimonides, 
We're earning money from the public and the community. And even if we, and even if we say that all authorities agree with the Rambam, we live in a generation where we must accept money from the public so the students could continue with their learning. If not, they will not sit and learn and the Torah will be forgotten from Israel. As you can see, the ruling of Rabbi Gamliel, Rabban Gamliel, the son of Rabbi Yudha the Prince, who said you must work along with the Torah study, later on became a ruling in halachic teaching by the Maimonides. Later on became something that people said, if we really want to be the next Maimonides, if I want to be the next Rabban Gamliel, the next Rabban Gamliel, I must learn all day. And then the halacha started to find some solutions. Solution will be support from charity, from tzedakah, would be support from the public. We know there is an halachic ruling, for example, that says that if there is a war, whether the students of the yeshiva should come and join them or not. That's another discussion. Maybe we'll talk about it, about some Talmidei Chacham, some yeshiva students joining the, the IDF, for example, or joining the military, whether they can just sit down in the yeshiva and learn and study and not take, you know, uh, also part of this burden called the IDF. We can talk about all of this, but the halachic authority has shown and demonstrated that when they needed, they found a way out of this kind of thing. And that leads us all the way until today where we know there is yeshiva students who according, based on this, and brought only one, there's many, many, many others. Based on those halachic authorities later on said, we can, we're allowed to sit down only in yeshiva without going to work and be subsidized or get some support, financial support from our fellow brothers that pay taxes from fellow brothers that go to work. This is a little bit of how it goes um, on this way. I want also, before we finish, to see in source number 11, in Penine Halacha, source number 11. And then I'll have, as I said at the beginning, I'll have uh, five minutes at the end for questions if someone has, a, if you want to follow up on things that I'm saying here. So the Penine Halacha, Rabbi Eliezer Melamed. Rabbi Eliezer Melamed, that's a modern book. He's a modern rabbi. He's a rabbi of a settlement called um, Har Bracha, all right? Rabbi in a settlement called Har Bracha. He writes down halachic books. He's a religious Zionist kind of a rabbi. And he writes it down what, according to his eyes, would be about funding of Rechim, Beit Midrash fellows in these days, that's a very modern halacha. And look what he says. And I think we can all relate to that, whether we think we should be uh, uh, supporting them, maybe they, we think they're supposed to go to work. I think we can all relate to what he's saying and I'll explain why. In source number 11, the Penine Halacha writes down, according to all the sages that agree for the student to be paid from the public, this approval applies only if the student is returning back to the community. He can do so by teaching Torah to kids or adults, serving as rabbis of shuls, engaging in communal events, and so on and on and on. You learn Torah, show the public why you learn Torah. Don't just learn for your own intellect, your own enjoyment, and say, I'm going to sit uh, in the beach with a book open and I will get the money from everyone else. You're not allowed to do that. According to Rabbi Melamed, even those rabbis, like the case of Mishnah that we saw, that said he must be uh, supported from someone from the public, he didn't mean you go and sit in the beach and learn Torah and you'll get money from, from the skies. That's not what he meant. He meant that if you can sit down and learn, but you're going to pay off back going to return what you learn to the community. You're going to serve as a rabbi of the shul. You're going to serve as someone who teaches classes. You're going to serve as a teacher in kindergarten, in yeshiva, in school, in Hebrew school, wherever you can. You're going to use what you learn, what you study in order to teach others. Then he continues and he says, this is when we have the permit for some of the approval, the halachic approval for someone to sit down in yeshiva and earn the money and have support from the others. He continues and he says, however, if one is not engaged in communal needs and only learns Torah for his own sake and knowledge, this student should not be paid by the community and should be working along his studies, should not stay only in yeshiva and should not go with the communities. Now, what is exactly the ramification, the consequence, I would say, how can we relate everything we spoke now to the current event in Israel. It's very difficult. It's very difficult and I'm not sure there is one way to do so. I'm not sure there is one way of doing so. I can only tell you that whether we're on that side 
or in the other side, whether we think, you know what? There's yeshiva, learning Torah is important. We don't need so many people in the, to, to be employed to work. They can learn yeshiva. I will support them. I will help them. I have no problem with my taxes. Like many people in our government really, really think, whether you're on the other side, whether you say, how come? They're not going to work. They're learning yeshiva. They're learning only in yeshiva. They're only studying. I wish I would go and sit in the library and read all day and I don't, don't need to put some bread on my table. Doesn't matter where you are in, 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 this, uh, in this equation. I don't think we will settle in this, uh, not in this uh, session and not in Israel, not in this year also, this discussion in Israel. We'll see if the, the law will even pass with the problems of the, the current problems of our government and our coalition in Israel. But I think what I'm trying to convey here is that even if we think or not that someone should learn in yeshiva, at least we know and we acknowledge the importance that we have in our communities, people that can teach others, people that will serve as teachers, people that will serve as rabbis, people that will serve in those kind of Jewish roles and positions. And yeah, we can support them in a sense, it can be with a salary, it can be by subsidizing their daycares, it can be by giving them some money so they can learn in order to be rabbis or to be teachers, but we can't, we will never be able to sustain Jewish community, a thriving Jewish community without having those kind of people in their groups that will be able to teach others in that sense. How can really, can we relate it into this? I'm not sure. I don't know. Each one of you can think about it by yourself. But this is another way to demonstrate how we have the Torah have something to say almost on everything that we have in our lives, also from Pirkei Avot. So thank you very much. We're in the five last minutes of the session. I will uh, give some time for questions. Uh, I will start with the people in person if they have some any questions they want to ask, and then we'll move to the people at, uh, to those who on Zoom. So thank you very, very, very much. Is there any quick question for those in person? Yes. Okay. Yeah. rabbis were part of the people. They weren't going to live in a monastery like you know, Christians. And they they had to be part of the people. They were to be married, they were to have families, they were to be able to relate to what's happening in their community. And if they don't work and they live in a ivory tower or wherever they are, they have they have no idea what the world is about, you know. And it's I can see I can really appreciate this, you know. You, you can't have a, a learned person who is going to say things and influence the community who doesn't be, who isn't part of the community. I, I so much firm, right? That's the name? Friend. Friend. Yeah. Friend. I so much relate for what you're saying. First of all, thank you for saying that friend just said that how come, how can there be rabbi just repeating what you said to the Zoom? How can it be that there is a rabbi or someone who sees and learn Torah? If he's not engaging with the public, if he's not working, if he's not meeting and, and seeing his own people, what, what, when they suffer in their simchas and their, their, their sadness and he's not living along them, how can he be a leader, a spiritual leader or a leader at all of their community? So I have to say I'm very much related for, uh, 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 from what you're saying. I can only add that we have, the, that we have in, in Judaism, we have two kinds of leaders. We have a leader in the type of, I will call it in the type of, uh, Abraham, of Abraham, Avinu, our forefather. And we have leader in the type of Noah, like Noah from the ark. Why? Abraham, we know, he worked very actively, went from village to village to bring people back in Tshuva. He wanted people to be religious. He wanted people to acknowledge the fact that there is one God in the world. And he went actively and worked with them and spoke with them and had the Knesset Orchim. He brought the guests in and he was very part of, I would say, so-called the community. We have another type of a leader, a spiritual leader, which can be like Noah. Noah was a leader in his own ark. He just brought himself and his family and some couple of animals into the ark. He wasn't exposed to the outer world. He wasn't exposed to other people. He didn't know and didn't understand their suffering. He didn't understand, even he didn't understand why they're gonna be a flood. The major says he doesn't even know why they're gonna be a flood. So much he didn't relate it to the people, to the community he was part of. He was surprised they're gonna be a flood and that people are wicked in his own generation. So we have two types, two aspects of leaders. I very much relate to the first one. Very much relate to what you're saying to the, the leader, I would say, in the aspect and type of Abraham Avinu, which is more engaged in the community. Thank you. Thank you for what you were saying. Rabbi? I want to know if maybe you could share some thoughts with us about how this plays out in the real world. Some people in Israel have the choice to rely on charity and 
that they're putting on the government and the state. And other people don't have the rights. And it's not the government should have. We served in the army, and we saw the people choosing to serve their country and put their life on the line. And as, as part of me feel jealous or angry that other people your age get free money to learn Torah and don't have to serve. Okay, I'll repeat the very difficult, very challenging question that Reverend Grover is asking. Reverend Grover is asking, it's how do... to modern. It's connected to modern. So first of all, Reverend Grover mentioned, um, and I respectfully agree and I respectfully disagree also, that the government is um, helping um, people who want to learn Torah, not only in daycares, but they're getting this kind of, uh, I would say, monthly salary almost from the kind of charity or salary, call it how you want to name it, um, from the government in order to sustain their lives. And this is called in Hebrew, kitzbat avrech. Kitzbat avrech, we'll call it like a reimbursement or like whatever for, for someone who learns Torah, there's billions of shekels that are going every year for those who learn Torah, they get something. First of all, I, I want to say something that people don't necessarily know, even in Israel. When we say, when we talk about salaries to people who learn Torah that they get from the government, we're talking about 800 shekels a month. 800 shekels a month is around 200 Canadian dollars. I would say 300 Canadian dollars in a sense. 300 Canadian dollars in a month is a joke. It's a joke. So when we talk about people in Israel like to say they're getting salary, they're getting paid from the government, people think like they earn like a CEO in a high tech uh, company. First of all, this is not the reality. The reality is they earn 800 shekels from the government. The government doesn't help them even with uh, five times going to shopping in Israel. Israel is a very, very expensive country. It's a very expensive place to live in. It doesn't help anything. That's for some Yet people can say, but wait, it's not about the money. It's not about the amount. It's about the, the basis, about the, I would say the principle, right? The principle, is why would they get some money from this? First of all, I will start and say how I experienced it. That the fact that I know it exists, I didn't get any money from the government to learn Torah in Israel. I served in the army, like you said. Served for I didn't say this at the beginning. I served for four years in the army, uh, in the IDF, in a unit called Eight Two Hundred Shmona Matayim. It's a technological unit. I was a part of the intelligence corps uh, in Israel. I served for four years. The commander. The commander. Uh, if can everyone just mute themselves, it would be great. Um, it was wonderful, splendid time that I had. Maybe we'll speak about it in a different time. And before I, I went to my army, I, I learned in yeshiva. But I learned in yeshiva not getting any money. Not only that I didn't get money, <laughs> I paid a lot of money in order to learn in yeshiva. And I didn't have the, this opportunity to learn. So I don't know how I would experience getting money from the government in order to learn Torah. What I personally see it in modern Israel is, first of all, that many, many people are against it. Many, many people are against it. First, because I don't think they know why. But I also personally acknowledge the fact that we need people to learn Torah. I think the Torah, the Chazal, sages are saying, Torah magna umatzla. The Torah is a shield. Is I really, really, truly believe that learning Torah is something that supports the state of Israel. I'm not saying more than soldiers. I'm not saying less than soldiers. I'm saying that as someone who served for four years in the army, I think we need people that sit and learn Torah. We need it. How much? How, I'm sorry, how many people in the year, what exactly are the amount that they're going to get for the government? Who can do it? Is everyone, or maybe only the elite students, like we have uh, doctors that are getting, uh, I don't know, uh, money from the government to make, uh, to conduct research or something like that. We can discuss it how much. Was it supposed to be open to the public or not? I'm not sure, even though that I know that because it's open to the public, there are some, I want to say everyone, but there are some who use it in a negative way. There are some who are not really going to the yeshiva, they're just taking the money, it happens everywhere. But I do acknowledge the fact that we need a group of people, I would prefer it to be the elite people, to sit down and, and study Torah, because I think we're all getting benefited from that. This is- So you don't, you, there's no part of you that hates the government? No. That, you Sorry. Know, your friends are serving in the army and putting their life on the line. And other people are getting paid to sit and learn Torah. Many of whom are not the kind, the kind of elites you're talking about. 
I'm not, angry. I'm not angry. If I would have been something, I would be disappointed. I'm not going to be angry on this case. I'm not going to be angry on them for, for, for not serving in the army and preferring to learn Torah or not going to work and preferring to learn Torah instead. I'm also a little bit jealous. I have to say also a little bit jealous. I would like to sit down and learn Torah all day long, but I, I can do it. And I really think someone needs to combine going out and work and also learning Torah. I'm not, I'm not angry. Part of it would be as my personal position that Israel should have what is called a professional army and not a army that is, is, is forced on everyone to go to, but well, this is for a different discussion that we might, uh, we might have. Yeah, we might have. Yes, so please. So I, I, I understand your point and everything, but I'm thinking of teachers who work at uh, a private Jewish high school here in Toronto. Now, they took four to five years of schooling to become this teacher, they teach during the day, and then there are some teachers who are learning either in the summer or at night, I don't know, you know, to uh, continue their studies. But they're making money so that they can help support their families. Where is the difference? Why can we do it here in Canada, in Toronto, but they can't do it there in Israel? Wow, wow, wow. Hey, Everybody, <laughs> please, your name again? <laughs> Adele. Adele, Adele. So Adele is asking, Wow, that's a very that's a very challenging question. Adele is asking, um, why don't we have in Israel this model of people that are teaching, for example, in day schools or they're teaching in Hebrew schools, and on the afternoon and afterwards in the summers they're taking some time to learn Torah. First of all, I'm not aware of how I would say um, widespread this this model is here in Toronto. I, I don't really know. I apologize. Um, I don't really know. I also don't know how much it's, I would say uh, if it is or not in Israel. Uh, I, I mean, I know that on, based on my personal experience, then teachers are trying to learn as much as possible during their days, um, like in any other topic. I mean, I want my history teacher to learn more history so we will become a better teacher, as well as I want my computer science teacher to learn more computer science and we'll become up to date and it will become better. Same thing would be with Torah. I want my Torah teacher to learn as much Torah as possible. But I, we also have in our, maybe it's good to mention, so thank you for asking it. We also have, in our Torah, we have something called Torah Lishma. Torah Lishma means learning Torah only for the sake of learning Torah. Not learning Torah for anything else. Learning Torah not for being a teacher, not learning Torah to, to be a rabbi, not learning Torah for to getting money, not for anything. Just learn Torah in order to learn Torah, because we have a mitzvah. To learn Torah, we should, the Torah says, you should learn the Torah twice a day, morning and night, and all day long, the same thing. So we have the mitzvah to learn Torah. We want to fulfill this mitzvah like any other mitzvah. We want to be able to learn Torah as much as possible. But we also acknowledge the fact that we need to put bread on the table, and not the entire burden can fall on the wife or on the children, and we don't want to be under the poverty line. And just like the Rambam, or even before Rabbi Gambiel said, it's a little bit dangerous, and then following what you said, it's a little bit dangerous if you only learn Torah and you're not really experiencing the people. So I don't know if this model works in Israel or not. I don't know how much. I do know that there is also importance of learning Torah only for learning Torah and not only to become greater, better teachers in a sense. And this is something I'm very much supportive of. Can I say something? Yes, Ruhama. Hi. Uh, uh, hi. Uh, I was in the army, uh, but as a as a religious girl, uh, which I went to the uh, to the Nahal uh, for three months of a uh, training imunim, then they sent me to teach a uh, rather than a, uh, than going to fight. Uh, so they sent me to Tveria at this time, you know, and they, uh, and I was teaching the rest of the time. So it's a, uh, there is a kind of a pshara, you know, from one side you do learn, the, you do, you do get training, but then a religious girl didn't go to the army to fight, but uh, since I was a teacher, they sent me to teach. Okay, very good. Very good. Let's apply it also to Torah studies. Again, I think it's very much to what Rabbi Milamit said. We need to learn Torah, in, and you're going to get the money if you're going to pay off back to the students. It's keep learning, but teach also. We say every morning, we say in Kriya Shema, in the second bracha, the second blessing before Shema Israel, we ask for Kodesh Baruch Hu that we can learn Torah, we can comprehend Torah, we can understand Torah, but we also ask to teach. We also ask to teach our children and teach the other guy the, the other Jews that we have around and we, we, we want that our Torah will not be only something we learn but we want it to be exposed to others and we want to try and bring as many people back to the circle as we can in that sense so definitely definitely I agree with you Ruhama definitely I agree with you thank you
Any questions also from the people on Zoom? It's time. Just one question. Um, yes. Hello, nice to meet you. How can a religious Jew say, I want to study Torah all day long when all of these sages are saying, no, you don't do this? How can they go against them all? I don't understand this. So again, I said I didn't have time, unfortunately, in this scope to say, to give the entire halakhic discussion. I just brought a little bit at the end that there is halakhic room for approving for, for people. Not, what? Yeah, the kiss of mission. You can look again on source number nine, 10, number 10. source number 10. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Rabbi Grover mentions that's right. The kiss of mission, Rabbi Yosef Karo, for many, many places, he, he disagrees with the Rambam in many places, or maybe he adds some stuff, and he's the one, you can see in source number 10, that says, I'm sorry, Rambam. Times we can't, change. We, times has changed, as Rabbi Grover said, times has changed. We need to learn uh, to learn Torah more days, uh, more hours a day, and we need to, to get some money from that. What can we do? He's only the first one, but there's also many, many, many others from him until this day who support this kind of, uh, I would say, this kind of idea and continues it. I, now, I think that they all agree this is only what is called Bediavid. Bediavid means it's only because we don't have any other choice. If we would have had a choice, we can learn the Torah in the best way possible and not need uh, and not getting money or charity from others, that would be the best. But because we can't, then and we want to be great Torah scholars, that's what they're saying. See, I must sit down in the Shiva and get some uh, sustenance, sustenance from other people, helping sustenance from other people. Is, that's what they're saying. Do you think interesting? Look at what the Kesef Mishnah does. You have a thousand years of precedent, at least a thousand years of. You are not allowed to take charity and learn Torah. It's clear, black and white. And suddenly the Kesef Mishnah comes in and says, Times have changed, we're doing things differently. Don't ever say that Judaism does not believe, Mr. Orthodox Rabbi, do not believe <laughs> that Judaism does not believe in change and evolution and even radical change. Radical change. Definitely. We change right. all the time. We you change all the time. It, but you're presenting a text that affirms a Judaism that is evolving. This is right. It just evolves. Judaism all the time evolves. I mean, like now that I'm presenting any other Orthodox rabbi, but. I, I, oh, and you don't go that so called 5,000 years ago, in that sense. So, um, that's true, but here we see this very, very good example how halakha changes in the sense that we may like it, we think there are more. This is an example of how we change. No, no, maybe for next time. Like it looks yeah. like, but again, this is only one source out of many. It's, it's more complicated than that, Rabbi. It's more, you know, that it's more complicated than that. You know that it's not that easy to change. It's not that easy to change, but things are changed, definitely. When there is a rabbinic will, there is a, there is a way. way. Might be, might be. I see that Claudette has a question, Claudette? Yeah, my question is that if the government is paying for a sum that is not really taking the person off of the poverty line, really. And the person is only engaged in Torah study for themselves and themselves. They're not benefiting anyone else. What do you say to that? That they're wrong. So how do you, how do the government now make that individual contribute to society, even though they're learning? I I don't know if that's a Torah question or is that a political question. Um, I really don't know what to tell you. How, how is it? It means that if they will not get the help from the government, there might be a bigger burden on the Israeli economics without having a way to send their kids to school. It might be worse for us. The entire thing, if we're looking at the macro, I'm not a, an economic guy or whatever, but if you look on the macro kind of situation in Israel, If they're not going to send their kids to school, it's going to be way more difficult on us. 
later on because they don't have education. They're not going to be, uh, it's going to be very difficult. So I believe this is what's going to be behind it. I mean, you cannot fight it, then try to ease it as much as possible. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions on Zoom? Okay. All right, everyone. Thank you very much again for coming, thank bringing you. those in person. Excellent. Thank you for those on Zoom. And we'll be back again next week on Monday, uh, same time to 15 to 3.15. And uh, thank you very much for all joining.